Father, we thank you for the things that you have done and are doing in our midst. Father, we thank you again for those that have gone before us. And Father, those that made decisions that would impact our life. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask, Father, that you would open the eyes and ears of our spiritual hearts, Father. Lord Jesus, just help us understand today's message because it is so important. Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you. In your precious name we pray, amen. You can stick your finger in Genesis real quick. Actually, Ephesians 5 will be the first place we go. <clears throat> but if you've noticed today, there are many that take the institutions, there are many that do not take the institutions of God seriously. See, God made, again, we, we're in this series of God's divine establishment, and in his divine establishment is the perfect plan, the perfect provision, the perfect purpose, all for his pleasure. But so many today, and in that, and in that divine establishment, are institutions. There are institutions. And, and we need to remember this. The institutions within the divine establishment create a structure of foundational stability that keeps the whole house stable. So here we have the institution of, let's say, the institution of marriage. And then we have the institution of family, and these are the two we're talking about today. So the institution of family begins where, well, let's just go back to Genesis, where Adam and Eve. Eve was given to Adam. I want you to understand that. Eve was given to Adam. I truly believe, based on God's word and the institutions of marriage, that God has somebody for everybody, and that person is being personally prepared, and only will he bring those two together when each one of them pulls their heads out of their rear ends and figures out who God is. But many of us get impatient, and we run looking for what we want. And then we go... That's not really what I wanted. See? And I know because that's what I did the very first time around. I didn't wait for God. Had I waited for God, along would have come Crystal, and I wouldn't have had to go through all the crap from before. You see, when we start taking things into our hands instead of God's divine establishment, That's when things start to get screwed up. So let me, let me go on here. <clears throat> so when we violate those institutions, the structure fails and chaos ensues. Chaos ensues. It was so cool because I didn't even talk about the, that yesterday was Plymouth Mass Day. We're, we're, we're that close. Let's go to Plymouth Mass. Let's go look at all the things that were institutions that God set into motion. We met this man, his name was Leo Martin. He, he looked like the very, he looked like William Bradford. Honest to God, we looked at the statue of William Bradford and I went, that's Leo Martin. Just with a different hat. Leo's a very knowledgeable man. He has studied, and a lot of wisdom, he has studied the truth about the pilgrims. And he has studied the truth about what happened when they landed. And one of the things he said to me was this, as we're sitting there listening, he says, don't believe what the world tells you has happened down here. He said, I will tell you the truth. And he said, I'm going to first tell you that when I speak, a lot of people become offended. And I'm like going, do you swear? You know what's that? And I'm in my mind, I'm going, are you going to drop the F-bomb six or seven times? And he said, no. He says, I'm a believer. So he's going to give it to us from the Christian perspective. And in that Christian perspective are the institutions 
that God put forward that these people carried over. But you know what happened? The same thing that happened to the Israelites. The institutions were forgotten. And that's what's happened today. The institutions have been forgotten. And this is why everything in the world is in chaos. But here's the deal. It's part of the plan of God. It's part of the divine establishment of the perfect plan with the perfect provision, with the perfect pr purpose for God's pleasure. See? So when we get all, oh, it's because we don't trust the plan. We don't trust the plan. But God's plan is perfect. God's plan is perfect. I love that we got down to, we got down to Leah's and... Leah looked at my wife and she goes, you're healed. She goes, don't you ever doubt that. You are healed, period. And, and I just went, because Leah's told me this before. She goes, your wife's going to be fine and God's going to heal her. And I went, okay, works for me. That's good. See, when we don't throw ourselves into the worry and chaos of the world and we just trust God in all these things and we follow his word as it was written and spoken in context Old Testament content New Testament then we don't have to sit there and freak out and worry about what's going on Somebody said to me one day, oh, aren't you worried? I said, no, man, I popped pop, pop, popcorn. I popped popcorn. I said, I sit down in my big, huge chair, and I said, I'm watching the movie play. Because you know what? In the end, I got a mansion in heaven. And you know what? I'm secure in the fact that I belong to the Lord. And when the show is over, and the lights go out, whoosh, then I'm going home. See? Don't need to worry about it. So we spoke on volition last Sunday. And today we're going to speak on two other institutions. And I find it interesting because we see the world head towards the fulfillment of God's perfect plan. We as well see the absolute denial, the absolute denial of God's institutions today as they were written in the beginning. In the beginning. Not some quasi made up delusional illusion that somebody keeps telling us it is. In the beginning, the institutions were formed. They were part of the divine establishment. And man, through his stupidity, has constantly tried to change them to satisfy his selfishness. <clears throat> and what I find even more shocking is the stance the church is taking in not following the institutions and the divine establishments that reveals God's perfect plan. It was funny because we were, we were talking to Leo. And like I said, Leo is a very wise man when it comes to pilgrims and very wise when it comes to the word of God. And one of his words were this, I cannot believe the church is doing the things that it is doing today. And I said, oh, absolutely. I said, I agree. I said, the, you ever had a Dunkin' Donuts coffee that you've drinking all the coffee in? There's just a little bit of cream, a small bit of coffee. You leave it in the sun for a few hours and now you come out and you have watered down cream Dunkin' Donuts splash coffee and you drink it because you're thirsty. That's what the word of God is being spilled out as today. That watered down Dunkin' Donuts coffee with a splash of coffee and 4,000 gallons of cream in it. And people are drinking it. No, it's not going to happen here. Because if it's, even if it's just me here, I don't care. Because I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. <clears throat> We invited Leo here. Never know, someday. He's been to Maine. 
As a matter of fact, he got, he got his wife found Jesus at the, the Lucky Lady Hotel, which is a pit in somewhere up in northern Maine, and uh, she stole a Gideon's Bible. But see, the Gideons put Bibles in drawers so you can't steal them. So it's not really, it's not, she wasn't really a thief. She was taking Gideon's Bible. It was good. Yeah, it does. It tells you to take the Bible. So the word for marriage in the Hebrew is bawal, B-A-W-A-L. It's pronounced bawal, and it means to marry as well as rule over. Now, some people are going to freak out here. What do you mean rule over? Because I remember going to a church, and I, they would not say the word have dominion over or rule over. And I went, okay, so now you've taken this part of the Bible. Now, I need to, I need before, you know, everybody gets their knickers in an uproar and, and, and in a twist. All right. I see the word dominion as well. Now, again, I know what everybody's thinking, but let's look at Ephesians 5, 25. So turn to Ephesians 5. You should have your fingers in there. Ephesians 5, 25. It says this. I hope the husbands are listening. Because when God said, I've given you rule over and dominion, he didn't give you a whip. And he didn't give you a flogging device. And he didn't say, you're the one that gets to make every decision that happens. This is what he said in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands. You must love your wives so deeply, so purely, and sacrificially that we can understand it only when we compare it to the love Jesus has for his bride. Do you know how many husbands take that thing, that, that, word, that word marriage, and go, I'm the ruler of this thing? Well, get your head out of your you-know-what. And quit wearing your ass as a hat. Because here's what, this is what it means right here. You must love your wives so deeply, purely, and sacrificially that we can understand it only when we compare it to the love that Jesus has for his bride. The church. Did you hear me? I know some of the men just went, oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh, I didn't want to hear this. That takes away all my power. You still have power. But the power can only come through God. It can only come through the Lord. Because if you abuse your power, he will take it away. Oh, thank you. Now it's up there. I know. <laughs> oh, we know he gave himself up. He, get, we, he gave himself up completely to make her his own. Did you hear that? Washing her clean of all her impurity with water and the powerful presence of his word. He has given himself so that he can present the church as his radiant bride, unstained, unwrinkled, and unblemished completely free from all impurity, holy and innocent before him. So how many husbands constantly try to embarrass their wives and their shortcomings? Hank, quit laughing. I, I know better because we spent some time with you guys, and I know better. I know better. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. The institution of marriage was God created. Now turn to Genesis 1.16. You 
you're going you're gonna to have to think a minute with this. All right, because as I, as I read this, I'm going, Lord, what's this got to do with anything? And he said, listen, God fashioned the two great lights, the two great lights, the brighter to mark the course of day, the dimmer to mark the course of night. One without the other doesn't work. It's kind of interesting. We, we went and saw this statue, the, um, the, forefa- the, the forefather statue. Monument to the, forefathers. Monument to the forefathers. This thing is huge. It should have been 85 feet higher than it was, but it was too big. This thing is massive. Here's what I recognize. The first thing, we walked up, I'm looking at these statues, and I noticed that the women have no eyes in the statue. Now, why wouldn't they have any eyes? Because they have an inner brightness. The men had eyes because they had outer strength. One without the other does not work. So if you think that in a marriage you can get by with just one person and not working as a team, which God made Adam and Eve to work as, You don't understand the institution of God's marriage. See? So as I'm looking at this statue, I'm going, ah, that's the illustration. And then Leo comes out with, you know, the woman has the inner strength, the man has the outer strength. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. The brighter to mark the course of day, the dimmer to mark the course of night. And the divine needle night with the stars. What do, you, what do you think the divine needle night is? Those are the children. What did God tell, tell Abraham? Your children will be as many as the stars in the sky. Very interesting. So with the divine institution comes the divine institution of the family, which we'll get to in a minute. One of the things I, I've always said is, is if we do not know the past, we will never know what to do in the future. If we don't understand the past, then we are going to screw up the future bad. That's funny because that's the same thing Leo said. Because that's the same thing the pilgrims said. One of the pilgrims named their children Remember remember so I had to ask him I said why remember he goes so that they wouldn't forget what they're where they've came from I said oh like the Israelites and he said "Mm." I said they forgot why the 12 stones were in the place where they should be see and so when we forget to bring forward the word of God in content and context then we are doing a huge disservice to our children. And what happens? The starlights go out. See? So we've been given, all right, each other, man and wife, for a purpose. For a purpose. It's part of the divine institution of God in the divine establishment. See, now I had no idea you were going to be here today because you're about ready to get married. That's Dawn's, going to be Dawn's new daughter-in-law. I can't remember your name right now. Michaela. See? And so I didn't know Michaela was going to be here. So she's getting a great lesson in the institution of marriage today. Most people pay big money for this. I expect, you know... (laughs) No, I'm kidding with you. I've watched you and Dawn. I think you guys are going to be a fantastic power couple. I really do. So God rules the whole shebang. He's the bright morning star. Jesus rules over the children of God. He has dominion. And the Holy Spirit leads. When the husband takes a wife, he is the covering. He's the covering. Just as Christ became the covering for the bride, for us.
Now in the institution of marriage came the institution of family. The needle stars represent the children, as we just said. Now a divinely ordained marriage in its correct structure forms the basic stability in society. What's the first institution that Satan wants to attack? Family. But first, if he can succeed in using the eye gate to lure the husband into stupid stuff, like getting on a computer searching for his mate, which is really stupid, by the way, because you're probably not talking to a female. You're talking to a 400-pound guy that's sitting in his underwear on the computer, <laughs> posing as a woman, asking you for money. Sweaty beast that he is. Probably got all sorts of crap on his kitchen table, lives in a two-room apartment with his mom. <laughs> with his mom. Probably hasn't washed his drawers in a month. Stay off the internet. Stay off the internet. I just had to put that on there. <laughs> And in its correct structure, rejects anything that is outside of the structure or institution of the ordained institution. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you, uh, wait for God to do what God's going to do. Because when God does what God's supposed to do, then you will have exactly what God has ordained you to have. Quit shopping in the septic tank. The spiritual and the world cannot come together. They cannot. It's like gas and water. Go ahead and put gas and water in a cup. Shake it all you want. It's never going to combine. It will separate. And so Satan goes, if I can get them separated, if I can get the distraction in the man, because men are all visually focused, you know, if I can get the eye gate to turn this way, then I've exceeded in disrupting the foundation of marriage. Do you know that men in pornography is huge? And pornography is huge. And the only reason pornography is huge is because men sit at computers and are lured by the eyes. That's why. Also, if I can bring anarchy into a marriage and reject the foundational truths and the institutions of marriage that God has happened, here's what happens. These disorders, these anarchies, bring in promiscuity, homosexuality, and genetic disorder. Because they don't have a lack, because they have a lack of definition. And we're seeing it today. We're seeing man come up with new definitions of who they are and what they are. And that's because the institution of marriage has been thrown to the side. And if I don't like you in another five years, I'll just divorce you. And what does the Bible say? There's only one reason for divorce. And that's if you're out screwing around. See? Because marriage is a divine institution of God's. And it was made to last forever. Unless you're shopping in like one of those discount grocery stores where the meat's already three days old and it's turning a little brown. <coughs> But they're still selling it because somebody tends to tell you, oh, brown meat's good for you, because it's just seasoned. <sighs> it also ends in polygamy and excessive divorce. 
Remember, God gave Eve to Adam. She was a gift from God. Now, in the correct plan, the man in volition chooses which plan to be under. Without God, he can only rely on the laws of the nation for protection and freedom, which sometimes they're taken away by emotionalism. But for the believer in the perfect plan of God, we still have the rules and laws of the nation, but we have the added bonus of God's thinking for authority and protection. Proverbs 8, 32 through 36 explains it perfectly. So let's go there. Proverbs 8, 32, 36. It says, so now listen to me, not me. Now listen to me, my children. Those who live by my ways will find true happiness. And when I mean true happiness, I mean joy. Remember, happiness is fleeting, joy is everlasting. We'll find true joy. Pay attention to my guidance. Dare to be wise. When I say dare to be wise, I mean dare to discern the spirit. Don't believe everything you read or hear or see. I've said it before. This is how I judge what is right or what is wrong. This contains everything for every day of every moment of my entire life. Right here. And so, again, I want to live in the joy of the Lord. And don't disregard my teachings. The one who listens to me, who carefully seeks me in everyday things, and delays action until my way is apparent, that one will find true joy. That one will find true joy. For when he recognizes and follows me, he finds a peaceful and satisfying life and receives favor from God. But heed my warnings. The one who goes against me will only hurt themselves. For all who despise me are playing with fire and courting death. You see, we need to wait upon the Lord. We need to, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's not in the Bible because it's just there to fill space. There's a reason he says, wait upon the Lord. And renew your strength. Because you know what? If you're single and you're playing the dating game, and, and you're running around searching for Quasimodo in a Cinderella suit, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy. Especially when you find out it's some 600-pound guy who likes to eat Crisco by the barrel and is sitting at his mother's linoleum-laden chairs on a, on a, in a, at a kitchen table from the 1950s, <laughs> dipping Fritos into the Crisco. Oh my it's like, uh, and when you find out that, you say, oh, this is too much work. And the Lord says, you didn't wait upon me. You went shopping at the discount store, the store that only the shirts have half a sleeve. When I have the whole sleeved shirt, see? We've all made that mistake. I thought I knew what I was supposed to have, and I was wrong. I can admit that. It was for the, all the wrong reasons, all the wrong purposes, and all the wrong things. Mm 
We've, some of us have made that mistake. Doesn't mean God can't redeem it. Doesn't mean God can't redeem it. See? Because many of us have made decisions out of stupidity. We do it every day. <clears throat> so we need to wait upon the Lord. And he will reveal his plan for what is supposed to happen in our life. Now, Psalm 68, 5 through 7 says this. The true God who inhabits sacred space is the father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. He makes a home for those who are alone. He frees the prisoners and leads them to prosper. Remember, prosper is not money. Prosper is being prepared for the next part of your journey. Yet those that rebel against him live in the barren land without blessings and prosperity. I want you to understand something here in Psalms. Here's the thing. If you don't teach your children these verses, you are doing them a grave injustice. Because how are they going to prosper and be ready for the next part of the journey if you don't teach them these things? This is the... See, now, here we go. Oh, dads... You have to be the beacon of light. You're the brightest of the lights. You're the illustration of who God is or who Jesus is to the church. Because remember, you're supposed to what? Oh, I know. Love your bride sacrificially, lay down your life, and quit being a putz. Be the illustration. Be the illustration. And in being the illustration, as your kids see the illustration, they will prosper. They will prosper. Matter of fact, I think there's a verse that says, children, or first it says, parents teach your children in the way they should go and they'll never depart from it. But it also, children, listen to your parents and you will prosper. <laughs> see? I love it because... My son's coming back Wednesday because he's going to go take his CDL. And I, I, I said to him on the phone the other day, I said, so you know what the Bible says? Because every chance I get, I throw verses at him. And it's usually the verses that make him go, uh. See? Because, again, I have to be that bright light. Mom is the light in the night. But dad's the light of the day. And God is the light of all. And so as I cast light on him and say, you know, it, God can't honor the things you're doing if you're not honoring God in the things you're doing. Some people say, oh, I can't say that to my children. They'll hate me. I really don't care whether my children hate me or not. You should figure that out now. Because I want to do what the Lord has called me to do and uphold the institutions in the divine establishments. Because like I said before, I could give a rat's fanny what people think of me because you're not going to be the one that I'm standing for being accountable to. I will be accountable to Jesus. And so all my choices have to be made on his word. Because that's who I'm standing before. The Bible tells me that in Revelations... I am going to stand before God. I'm going to stand before Jesus. You know what's funny? The first book that was established, I think I got this right, that the pilgrims translated was the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations. Because it had how they had to walk and the end of the show when they walked the way they were supposed to walk. How many are so afraid of the book of Revelations today? Oh, my God, this is going to happen. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's wicked cool. <clears throat> I just have to figure out where I am. Ah, there I am. In other words... 
They never are brought into the next part of grace. So what happens? They become stunted in the faith. Walker exits stage left when we stop teaching them these things. Now I'm going to bring in the next institution, and it is the institution of family. And I'm not talking extended family. I'm talking your family that you will have when you become married. They will be your children. I'm not talking about extended family. This is family, first of all, husband, wife, and then the children that you're going to have. Some of us are done having children. All right? But there are still youngsters in here that will be having children, Hank and Patty. <laughs> for those of you watching I, I always pick on Hank I just threw Patty under the bus a little bit right there but um, again so Satan wants to destroy this foundation, foundation with everything he has he wants to destroy the family and the reason he wants to destroy the family if he destroys the family he destroys the foundation of that institution Really. I love it when people tell, tell me, well, you should raise your children this way. Well, you ought to kiss my you-know-what. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was spanked as a child, and I'm not, I'm not disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. Honestly, discipline is okay. Discipline is okay. As long as it's done in love, with grace and mercy. But discipline is okay. Because we're disciplined. God disciplines us. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. So Satan wants to do this because it brings an imbalance to society. In Genesis 4, 1, Eve was so excited when she gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, with the help of the Lord. How many people have children today and don't say, Lord, help me raise this child that you have given me? Instead, it's, oh, no. It's funny how, how, how young couples are excited when they first have it until the child keeps them up four nights in a row. And then it's, oh my God, I didn't know it was going to be this. Well, yes, you did. Maybe next time you ought to think about not doing, you know. Again, Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, train up a child in the way they should go. In the divine institution of family, God even gave instructions as to how to teach. You ready? Get your pens ready. I'm not quoting all these verses. I'm not going to say them all. I'm going to give you the verse. You go home and look them up. But the first one is Proverbs 22.6. You can abbreviate that with P-R-O-V. 22.6. Deuteronomy, D-E-U-T, 6, 5 through 9. Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 10. Matthew 19, 13 through 15. 1 Timothy 4, 10 through 1. Or 10, 1. 1, 10. I got it backwards a little bit there. 1 Timothy 4, verse 10 through verse 1 in 5. I think, or go 110, either way, it doesn't matter. You're going to get the same message. <laughs> then Deuteronomy 11:19. Yeah, read Timothy. It's not like that, that long. That's right, Ray. You might get a little more than you got. That's all right. It won't hurt you. Deuteronomy 11:19. And then on discipline, we find Proverbs 23. 13 through 14. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14. 
Then Proverbs 22, 15. Then Proverbs 29, 15. Then Proverbs 29, 17. So just go 29, 15 through 17. And then Colossians 3, 2. Ephesians 6, 4. Until the end of that particular chapter. And then 1 Corinthians 8, 9. And Matthew 5. 15 through 16 in Matthew 18 5 through 6 Proverbs 4 1 through 5 and Ephesians 6 1 it was kind of funny one of the stories Leo told us was the fact that these two fathers became friends one nursed the other one back to health I, was, was that the, was that massive or whatever his name is, the Indian dude. There's a big statue of him in a loincloth. First thing I said is, I want to be an Indian so I don't have to wear clothes. So I can run around in a loincloth. Because so. it was hot. Yeah, Massa, Massa, not Massachusetts, but Massaquata, whatever his name was. But him and, and one of the head pilgrim guys became close friends. But they never passed on the information they needed to pass on. So their two sons became enemies. And their two sons went to war. And the outcome wasn't good. You see, here's the funny thing. If we don't pass on the information correctly, it's going to lead to disaster. It's going to lead to disaster. Now, a number of people will process information the way they want to process it because we have selective hearing. We only hear what we want to hear. But with God's word, we need to hear everything. We need to understand everything. We have to have everything because when we have everything, what happens? We are well equipped. We are well equipped. See? And in well equippedness, then we can, can, we can live in the institution. In the world, the world is trying to destroy the family, and evil that lurks in the world is destroying children, even at conception now. I'm going to start, I'm going to start destroying them here. That way they'll never get to here. But I have a plan. If they get to here, then I can destroy them there. See? We need to stop. And this, this is what has happened in the world today. This is why abortions are huge. Because we've stopped using the word teach we stopped using the word teach teach them in the way that they should go not in the way you think they should go not in the way you want them to go but in the way they should go and they will never depart from it see and then be the illustration be the illustration of it because you know what really stinks is when your lips are flapping and your actions ain't matching your words. That stinks. Because then there is a confused message. And in the confused message, <laughs> you're really creating chaos. And that chaos will travel with them to a number of places. We stop teaching. You think we'd have learned this from the Israelites. Because what happened when they stopped teaching? All hell broke loose. We need to teach. We need to teach content, context, in the correct season, out of season, as it was written, as it was spoken, the way God formed it in the establishment and institution that he ordained. We need to do it that way. Because if we don't, you think it's bad now? This is a cakewalk. Because it can get worse. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, love you, and praise you, Father. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to have an understanding of 
the roots of these things. And Father, I love the fact that these were formed by you, created by you, so that we could live in joy. But Father, you also warned us what happens when we don't. Utter chaos ensues. Unhappiness. Death. So Father, today I ask, Lord, that you would show us exactly how we are to do this. Father, reveal to our hearts. Show us whether we've been doing it wrong or whether we've been doing it right. But Father, show us. And Lord, correct us so that we may teach correctly. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you, Father. In your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.